Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here to share with you. I've had this message on my mind for the last four weeks, and uh, we decided to uh, come back with a survival theme. So thus, my survival gear here that I'll be showing you in a moment. Um, we really feel like this is a season of being in like a wilderness together, a wilderness journey. So I thought I'd start off today talking to you about a little bit of backpacking in my history. So back in 1980, a buddy and I decided to go backpacking at Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. And we went to the uh, ranger station to figure out where we're going to go for three days, two nights. And uh, he's showing us the map. You're going to camp here. You're going to camp here and uh, come on back through this trail. And I saw the whole area where we were going circled. And I asked him, I said, sir, why is that area circled? He said, well, you know, to be honest with you, they've discovered there's lots of bears in that area. Bears. Okay, uh, so what do we got to do? He says, well, you just got to be really careful. You know, first of all, make sure you tie your backpacks up on ropes between two trees and uh, put these bells on your shoes so you don't wake up and scare the bear down the trail. So I'm like, I don't do bells, sorry. He says, well, would you rather be eaten by a bear? I said, give me the bells. So on go the bells. We jingle all the way down the trail. And, and it's starting to dawn on us we got a late start. And it's starting to get dark, and we're, and we're going in a certain direction, and we know our campsite's out there somewhere, but we can't find it. It's too dark. We need to camp right here, right now. So we, we break camp. We, uh, we put our tent up. We have our little meal, and uh, we tie our, our uh, meal, all our meal stuff up in the backpack, and between two trees, we're doing everything right, and we get ready to, to go in for the night into our little two-man tent. And my buddy says before he goes to sleep, he said, you know what? Remember that couple that got mauled by a bear last week in, in uh, Glacier National Park? The problem was they camped in a place that was between where the bear sleeps and where he goes to get water. And then he goes to sleep. And I'm like, well, thank you very much. What's the chances that we out here where we don't know where we are, that we have camped between where a bear sleeps and where he goes to drink? We don't know. But he's sleeping. I can't sleep. It's too loud. Coyotes are screaming like crazy. There's animals running all over, little rodents climbing on our tent, and, and, uh, and, and crickets and bullfrogs. It's really loud. And so I'm just laying there, just, oh, man. And suddenly I hear it. It's the sounds of a large animal walking outside our tent. It's not a squirrel. It's not a little chipmunk. I can tell. And now I'm really startled, like, oh my gosh, it's getting closer. What else could it be? Who walks like that other than a vicious, ferocious, hungry bear? And I'm starting to get worried because the, the footsteps just continue and continue. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I just wasn't ready for this. We got everything else. We got all this other supplies, but I'm not ready for a bear. So I grab my hunting knife and I'm holding it like this, shaking like crazy. And I think to myself, what am I going to do with this little knife? This is a bear. Why didn't I bring a shotgun? Why didn't somebody tell me? I'm out here in the wilderness. I'm facing a hungry bear. And the only thing between him and me is a little tent. He's surely going to have me for lunch. And I continued to hear the footsteps. Oh, oh, oh. You know, as I thought about where we are right now going through this pandemic, and I'll get to that story later. Keep you hanging on the cliff there. Uh, it feels a lot like we're out in the wilderness. We've done great with our survival skills, haven't we? Man, we have been doing everything online. You know, we got school at home, work at home, and on and on it goes how we've survived so far. But we still don't know what's coming. Is it a bear? A hungry, ferocious bear, and we're not ready? Or is it going to just flip back around and we'll be business as usual a year from now? Nobody really knows. And so I thought it'd be good for us to look into the Bible to find out what does God have to say to his people during times like this. And one of my favorite books is the book of 1 Peter. So I decided we would go there for our study today. I'd like us to uh, pray before we do that. Father, these are your words given to your people 2,000 years ago, but re very, very, very relevant for today. So I pray, God, that you would impress them on our hearts and help us know how to apply them on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So this book is written by Peter, of course, and uh, he is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He was also in Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They were going special trips with Jesus. And, Jesus, and he had been with Jesus in amazing places, like on the top of a mountain where Jesus is being transfigured and he's showing great light and clouds and, and God speaks from the cloud. And, and Peter sees that. He knows how powerful Jesus is. He's seen Jesus heal people, raise them from the dead, feed 5,000 people with five fish and two, no, five loaves and two fish. I'm forgetting right now. And he, and he does amazing miracles. And he knows that about Jesus. Jesus died. He saw that. And he was raised from the dead. Peter also has weaknesses. He knows that he failed Jesus badly by denying him three times. He knows that he fell asleep while Jesus needed him to be praying for him. He knows that he backed away from ministering to the Gentiles when his Jewish friends came along and didn't look highly upon him ministering to Gentiles. He knew that he had weaknesses. He knew the people he was ministering to who were scattered all over the place needed the same kind of encouragement because they might be tempted to let go of their faith. They might be tempted to give in to the culture of the time. He wanted to encourage them not to do that, to be strong, to stand up. He was also not only a, an authoritative author, he was a very gentle, loving shepherd, very humble. He spoke to them as a great leader, but also as a gentle shepherd. And I think of the people he was speaking to as an assaulted audience. They were people that were scattered all over because of their faith. They were being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. There was all kinds of cultural things that are pulling against them. Wild, talks about wild living, wild parties. Talks about them being lured into those things and that they've come out of those things and people give them a hard time because they're not going along with the crowd. They're also not willing to bow to the emperor and say the emperor is God. And that puts them in, in a lot of hot water with the government. And so they're losing homes, they're losing jobs. Sometimes just basic food and shelter and even losing their lives. They're an assaulted audience. Uh, it is, it's, it's a lot of difficult times for them. But Peter makes it clear in the first few chapters, you're a blessed body of believers. You have this salvation that is so precious. Jesus Christ is living in you. Jesus Christ is giving you a salvation that will never spoil their faith, that will last for eternity. No matter what's going on, this is just going to purify that faith even more. You're going to grow through this. You just got to stand up. You're going to be rewarded for your standing up for your faith. Don't give in to the culture and the pressure. And, and besides that, I call them a commission community because Peter is telling them, not only do I want you to survive all this and stand up for your faith, but I want you to shine the light to the world. He talks about doing good many times. Go and do good, do good. It's just like one of the themes that this church has had. Good news, good deeds together. Go out and proclaim the gospel to the world. He wants them to shine the light during this dark time and to not just survive, but to thrive. And although their suffering is far greater than what we're experiencing now, it's still similar in what we're dealing with. So let's look at the specific things that Peter tells them to look out for. First of all, in verse 1 Peter 4, verse 7, if you look with me in your Bibles, Peter says this, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. In this verse, we're challenged in three ways. The first thing he says is, the end of all things is near. And I hear Peter saying, watch out. Watch out. The end is coming. And boy, if it was coming soon, 2,000 years ago, imagine how soon, soon means now. You see, Jesus has promised that he's going to come back and take his people to heaven with him forever. Isn't that exciting? We can get excited about that. And we know that that's going to happen. And we've been waiting for it to happen. But for some, time, for, for some of us, it's been such a long time. Sometimes we wonder, well, when is it really going to happen? During seasons of pandemic like this and all the things going on, fires in California, oh my gosh, Oregon, Washington, all the, all the upheaval in the, uh, in, in the races uh, right now. It's, it's a difficult, difficult time. And it makes some of us wonder, maybe this is it. And I know some of you, you think it is. You might be right. 
but maybe it's just going to go back to normal. We don't know. The Bible tells us that during that, that end time, there's going to be a great tribulation. We know there's going to be difficult times ahead if that's going to happen. And depending on your theology, you think that you're going to go be with Jesus before that tribulation or in the middle of it or the end of it. We're not going to argue about that today. We don't know who's right. But we know there's going to be an end. We know Jesus is coming. And we know that he's going to take his people to be with him forever. But we also know there's going to be a judgment. We also know that those who do not have Christ in their life, those who have not prepared for eternity, those who are not ready to go into the presence of a holy God by having their sins forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, will have to face a Christless eternity. And judgment's sad, and that's a scary word. But it's also a joyful thing, especially if you are a first century Christian and you are being persecuted by an evil government that is taking the lives of your friends and your family You're glad that they're going to be judged. Judgment's not a bad thing when you're being oppressed and God is going to come and make it right. So it's it's all going to be good in the end. But but Peter is saying to this, hey, it's near. Maybe more near than you've ever known. So watch out. What else is he telling us here? Be alert and fully sober. I hear people saying, wake up. Wake up. See, I just woke up a few people in the back row there. Okay, good to have you guys back with us. Um, you know, he's just, he's, he's, you can hear his voice of urgency there. So because of all that we're going through, guys, we cannot mess around. We cannot allow ourselves to be alert into the culture that wants us just to kind of business as usual. You know, like even during the pandemic and during the quarantine especially, and, and, and I was guilty of it too. You know, what's the next thing on Netflix I didn't see yet, you know, okay. What's the next thing I got? Oh man, there's that whole series. Oh my gosh, we can binge on that. You know, and there's all kinds of ways to kind of just pass the time, just kind of be lulled into whatever. And it gets worse. Sometimes I heard alcohol sales were really up during the quarantine. Not surprised. Got to wash away our sorrows. Drug use. Suicides up. All kinds of domestic problems. People are stuck in their homes together. And now the problems that were there that they could avoid are really coming to the surface. We got to be alert. We got to be awake. We got to be ready to face these things. God is trying to get our attention and he's wanting us to, to look up. He says this, these same phrases, be alert and fully sober, three times in the book of First Peter. In First Peter 1, he talks about turning away from all the evil things that the world has to offer you and be holy and be like God. It takes a lot of being alert and sober to do that. He also talks about it in chapter 5 when he talks about that classic verse of the enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith. He says, be sober and alert there too. And so there is a bear out there, okay? Whether it is some kind of uh, ultimate end end times thing or whether it's just our enemy, the devil. So we got to be ready. We've got to wake up. We've got to watch out and and all for this purpose. So you may pray. What What do I see Peter saying to us there? We need to connect and cry out to God. You see, because if you don't connect with God during seasons like this, you can get depressed. You can get discouraged. Anxiety can just rise to the top and drive you crazy. You know, I remember uh, when we lived for uh, 20 years together as a family in the city of Highland Park. And before I say anything about the city of Highland Park, I want to let you know that 95% of the people are really good people trying to do the right thing, trying to take care of their families and live right. In fact, we probably got more from them than we gave. We got more from them than we gave to them. We learned a lot. They coached us and mentored us through crisis, us through adversity. But there was a bad element, maybe 5% of the people around there make it bad for everybody else. So that's why it's known as a high crime, low income area. And so we had drug dealers on our street and they're scary looking. They're out there on the street in wide open, just doing their thing all day long, selling drugs. We know they carry guns. We know that they're dangerous. And so uh, we just try to pray every time we go by and just pray, Lord, deal with these guys, get them saved, put them in jail, whatever it takes. I pray that they would stop what they're doing. But it went on and on and on for years. And I remember one New Year's Eve 
uh, New Year's Eve evening, I was uh, in my office and I, and I, and I heard the, the classic New Year's Eve celebration, which is gunfire, right? Now it happens everywhere. People blow up stuff on New Year's Eve, you know, it's going on all over. It's a crazy situation. But this particular night, it just seemed like the gunfire was especially loud and long and, and weapons like Uzis and AK-47s. And it just, it just, just struck fear in me. Like, oh my gosh, we're doomed. And the Lord led me to a verse from Psalm 37, the very first verse. Do not fret because of evil men. And he goes on to talk about how their judgment is coming and I'm going to protect the people who are mine. And the Lord just comforted my heart like, you know what, I got you, you're going to be all right. Went to sleep next morning, woke to fire trucks racing down our street. Always when there's a fire in the neighborhood, we go out and check. I look down the street and the drug house is on fire like billowing flames. I'm like, oh my gosh. I didn't celebrate just yet till I made sure nobody died. And after that, I'm like, yes. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to be okay. See, if we just wallow in our despair and we're just like, oh my gosh, gloom and doom, it's going to be awful. No, look up. God's doing a great thing right now. I'm going to go on record as the first person to ever say, I thank God for 2020. <laughs> I know, it's like, oh, 2020, let's just right, wipe it out of the record books. No, I, I'm thanking God for it because I think it's going to grow us and make us strong. It's hard. It's hard. The pandemic was hard. I, as a community pastor, I have to walk alongside of people who are losing loved ones. And, and there were some COVID deaths in there. And I did a funeral for another woman who was a good friend of ours. It's a hard time. It's very sad. But even that grows us. Even that God is at work. And if we don't connect with him, if we don't cry out to him, we'll miss that. We'll miss that great strength that's available to us. So as we move forward in these verses, I see Peter giving us uh, some things we have to have with us to, to survive, some survival skills, some skills we need to practice, we need to learn, we need to grow in if we're going to make it, if we're going to thrive through it. And if you go on the website of the government called ready.gov, you'll find a list of all the things that you need to survive 72, 72 hours if a disaster hits. And, 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 the, and you can get all these things and have them in your house so you'll be ready to, to survive. And if you don't have them, you'll be in trouble. Like in two, uh, 20, 2000, year 2000, the, uh, you know, the, the, the power grid went down and we were three days without lights, you know, multiple cities and states. We were ready. Thank God for my neighbors had, uh, uh, you know, had generators. We plugged in, kept the fridge going. But it was a, a time of crisis. And so it's a good idea to have that kit in your home. But what, about, what do we need to do spiritually? We need a spiritual disaster supply kit. To make it easy, I'm going to call it a spiritual ready bag. So these next few verses will be, what are the things we need in our spiritual ready bag? Verse 8, Peter says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Man, so important right now that we get to the point where we're able to love people, not just friendship, not just affectionately, but deeply and completely. This is a serious form of love here. This is, this is uh, from the Greek word ektenes, which means to stretch out. It's gonna be stretching to love the way Jesus asks us to, the way Peter asks us to here. And I've gotten in my spiritual ready bag this coat. When you're backpacking with people, you share your supplies with each other. You, you help give to the other person. You put the other person ahead of yourself, ahead of your own needs. The word here for love is agape. It is the greatest form of love, the highest form of love. And Jesus demonstrated that love for us on the cross when he died and shed his blood. Thus the red coat, the coat that reminds us of Jesus' agape love. And he says, greater love has no man than this. And he lays down his life for his friends. And he says, as I've loved you, love one another the same way with agape love. It goes deep. It goes strong. And it goes so far as even when people who offend you, you can still love them. You can, you can go as far as uh, uh, completely where uh, it says love covers a multitude of sins. Thus, I have the blanket here to remind us 
that our love should cover sin. What are we doing in our culture now when somebody does something wrong? When we know what to do, we beat them up on special social media. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We got to get those. We got to expose sin. We got to let people know how bad people are. Well, that's not what God's word says. It doesn't mean we let people run all over us. It doesn't mean we let sin go without having people be accountable or confronting them and being restored to them. But it means we have to be ready to cover them. There are brothers and sisters. How do we help them get out of it? How do we help them get strong and recover from what they've done? How do we get restored with them ourselves? Galatians 6.1 says, if anyone is caught up in a sin, you or a spiritual should go and restore them and do it gently, not harshly, not in public. We are the community of believers. We are to reach out and love people deeply, love people completely, stretch ourselves out over those differences, stretch our love out over those things that divide us. I've never seen more division in the church, never seen more division in our country than today. What will it take for us to bridge the gap? And I think this is it. It's love, the way Jesus loved. May the Lord help us all grow in our love so we can love deeply and completely. In 1 Peter 1.22, uh, Jesus, or Peter said, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. So he says it there again. And he tells us where the source of that love is. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. In other words, you've received love from God. You've received grace from God. You've received forgiveness from God. And that love that's flowing in you can flow out of you. If you're having trouble loving right now, let me encourage you to experience more of God's love, to just go to him and say, God, help me. Help me in this area. It's really hard to love right now. Proverbs 10, 12 tells us, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrong. Let us be those that practice love deeply and completely. What else is in our spiritual ready bag? Verse 9 says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. The second skill we must learn to hear in our spiritual ready bag is to share. Okay? And first thing is hospitality. And hospitality back then, what you would do is open up your home to people. Okay? And to be hospitable. Strangers come in and people come in town and visiting and we, and we share with them. So I have to represent our... Uh, giving up our homes, our little, little tent here where uh, you know, people can dwell in. They can bring people over. You can have them over for dinner. You can fellowship with them. You can share what God's blessed you with. You can share all the things that God has given you with others, and you can pr provide for them basic needs, and you can uh, have, have meals with them, and you can supply things that, that they're in need of, especially during the times of the pandemic. And I'm really excited about how much our church gave during that time. You know, lots of lots of supplies going out all over the place. It was a beautiful thing. Many have opened up your homes to others. You've done that. And, 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 and we experienced that too uh, in, when we were living in Highland Park. We were amazed at how the people there gave to one another. It just seems like people that are in, in a time of struggle financially and whatever seem to be the most generous people. They were letting people into their homes. They were inviting us over for dinner. They were feeding us some of the most incredible food. Oh my gosh, I got to love sweet potato pie like I never knew before. We felt loved. We felt accepted. We, and we tried to invite people into our home as well and share not only what we had, but share the love of Jesus with them. And when we do that, we, we, shine, we shine the light to them. They see God's love. They see God reaching out in the darkness to encourage them through whatever they're dealing with. We need to love deeply and completely and share joyfully that's the other qualifier. All of these things Peter gives us are not things we just do. Well, we just share. Yeah, we'll share. There's always a qualifier. Joyfully. Not grumbling. That's what it says there. Without grumbling. It's so hard, isn't it, sometimes? Because sometimes it gets annoying to have somebody to have to, you to have, depend on you all the time. Sometimes it's really hard. 
Uh, there was one uh, woman in particular who had a, uh, who was pregnant and uh, she had lost her other children because of she was uh, dealing with crack addiction. And so we, we had her come into our home. And, and after you know, a couple months, it was, it was like, wow, we got it. You know, this is getting tough. <laughs> we need to help this woman find a place to live. And so we found a shelter that would take her in and give her the resources to find a new home and to get a job and to get drug rehab. And that was a better situation. But just the illustration there is that being hospitable, sharing can be hard. And you might want to complain. But Peter challenges them to do it joyfully. Thirdly, verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Peter's saying here that God has given you a gift and it's not for you to just use for yourself. You're not supposed to keep that quiet. You're supposed to share it with the community. The community depends on your gift. Your gift is critical. Your gift is important. And he divides it into two different categories. One is speaking and one is uh, serving. And we're to contribute powerfully through those two categories. One is speaking like I'm doing for you now. And I'm speaking to you about God's word because the Bible says we should speak as if we're speaking the very words of God. It says that in verse 11. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. So my prayer is that when I'm talking here today and we've been praying and the prayer team has been praying and and, uh, and I'm so thankful because what we want you to experience today is God speaking to you. You know, I'm just a human being. I've studied really hard, and I want you to, to, to give you what I think the text is saying, but I really pray that you hear God's words today. And so uh, whether you're doing it for adults or whether you're one of the children's workers or youth workers, man, we need people who are speaking God's word to others. Maybe you're not a public speaker, and you don't get up front like this. In fact, community pastors, we don't often get up like this. It's kind of rare, but we do more of our speaking in, in hospitals and in homes and with life group leaders and in, in discipleship groups. Maybe you're a counselor and you counsel someone who's grieving. You speak those words there. You're just someone who comforts people. You talk to them and listen to them. That's speaking the very words of God. But some of you, and praise God for you, have the gift of service. And we need you out here. We need you to, to bring the things that you always help us with. Think about our, our first responders during the pandemic, how much we needed them helping us in our hospitals, how much we needed the people of this church to be serving their communities and serving one another. Oh my gosh, when this uh, service opened up, you should have seen all the busyness going on this week. All the people were serving gifts were just getting really busy getting things ready for you today. It was a beautiful sight. It's a powerful thing. And so the Bible says, Peter says, serve with the power of, that God gives you, the strength that God supplies. And, and, and of course, let's not forget, uh, you know, the other things that uh, our service people give us. You know, that was in uh, limited supply not too long ago. But he says, don't do it in a way that's in your own strength. See, I think there's a couple problems that happen with people who have serving gifts. One, they can serve so much they get burnt out and don't take care of themselves. They don't have boundaries. They don't know where to start and stop. And part of that is because some of them have a problem with performance mentality. They want to serve so much so that people will like them or that God will approve of them. And we have to watch out if we have that tendency and ask God to help us not to serve to the point where we burn out, not to serve for the wrong reasons, but to serve with the strength that God supplies. People, if we do this, if we are loving deeply and completely, if we're sharing joyfully, if we're serving and contributing powerfully, things are going to happen. Our, our church family is going to be strong in our faith. We're going to feel a sense of love for each other like we never feel, felt before. The world's going to see it. This, oh, look how they love one another. Look at how unified they are. What's their secret? And then we can tell them it's, it's Jesus in us. And that message will resonate to this community. It'll resonate throughout the Detroit metro area. It'll resonate around the world as we're serving and blessing countries all over the place like we've already done. Like I used to bump into you guys all over 
over in the city of Detroit with boxes of love, with prayer rallies, with helping people clean up their neighborhoods. It's amazing what God's love will do in our community. But when it's all said and done, we have to be those who say we give all the glory to God. And that's our final verse here, 11b. So then all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And the worship team is going to take us through a song. It's going to help us apply this a little bit in our worship time. And I really encourage you to pay attention to the words of this song. It's a very powerful song. It's a very impactful song. It'll help us uh, kind of settle this whole thing of why do we do what we do? We do it for his glory. today, that's really what we want the declaration and the cry of our heart to be. God, let every single thing that we say and do be all for your glory and for yours alone. Let's stand together and sing. Yeah. 
So as I laid there in my tent, clutching my hunting knife in great fear that I was in the final moments of my life and a great battle was to ensue as I heard I happened to notice something that when I opened my eyes I heard it and when I closed my eyes I heard it again open close what is going on can this bear see me? Is he messing with me? Surely he knows I'm fearful right now. But what's going on here? <laughs> my eyelash is scraping on my pillow and it's resonating to my ear and it sounds like a bear is walking outside and it's just my eyelash on the pillow. Embarrassed and humiliated, I fell off to sleep. It wasn't a bear. It was a false alarm. People, this could be a false alarm. This may not be the end, but maybe it is. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's get ready. What is your next steps? Maybe you need to receive Christ. You've heard about this community of faith. You want to be a part of it. You heard about this Jesus and his love that, 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 that extends to us by by sacrificing his life, you're ready to receive him. In the moments as we pray, I invite you to, that you would invite him into your life and ask for forgiveness for your sins. Be ready to meet God if this is the real end, if he's really coming today, tomorrow, soon. Maybe you need to just rev up your discipleship process. It's time for you to get into something, something in the church, some Bible study, some kind of regimented pre preparation for what's coming. What do you need to do? Grow stronger in the Word. Grow stronger in learning how to love people. Learn strong, go stronger in learning how to share your faith. We've got all kinds of things coming up this fall, all kinds of ways you can plug in. You'll see some videos in just a moment about that. I encourage you not to sit on this, to get, some, get in with the community and get your Yourself to where God wants you to be so you can love deeply and completely. You can share joyfully and you can contribute powerfully. Let's pray. God, I thank you that as we are alert right now to your presence in this room right now, God, we cry out to you, God, we connect with you because we need you during this time, Lord. And, we, and Lord, especially those who, who have never given their lives to you, they've never allowed your grace to flood their heart with forgiveness and with a relationship with you. They don't know what it means to have God in their life and to have the presence of Jesus within them, to strengthen them, to give them hope for the future. I pray right now they would receive you. They would cry out to you in faith and allow you to make them new. And Lord, for the rest of us, God, show us what those steps are. God, help us to find a way where we can strengthen ourselves. We can have our spiritual ready bag ready. Lord, and we'll be honoring you and serving you the way that you desire. So many will come to faith in you through our efforts. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stay for a little bit and watch some of the videos about what's to come? I'm so grateful for John's message today. We're always going to have unseen challenges that pop up in life, and being spiritually and emotionally ready makes such a huge difference in how we handle those seasons. Let me share with you a couple of great opportunities for you to prepare yourself for whatever life throws at you. The first is called The Eight, and it's written by Pastor Bob Shirock. This study guide takes you through the eight traits of a growing disciple and really makes plain how to grow as a follower of Jesus. But it isn't something you wanna study alone. And that's why starting at the end of September, the eight will be a study we offer in person here at our Novi location. Of course, there are eight sessions in the study and each is a mix of teaching coupled with a small group study and discussion. It's a great way to jumpstart your spiritual motor and get re-engaged in church life. Registration is open now, and you can find the link in your digital bulletin today. The second opportunity I wanna mention is our life studies. And these will be offered online this fall via Zoom. They're great places to explore spiritual, emotional, and financial health. Two studies are starting next week. Living Well and Loving Well both begin on Tuesday, September 15th. And then Financial Peace University begins Monday, September 21st. Space is available in all studies, and you can find registration links as well in your digital bulletin. 
And parents, don't forget to sign your kids up for their weekend classes that begin October 3rd and 4th. Space is limited this fall, so you don't want to be late for that registration. That's it for this week. Next week, Pastor Bob will take us back into the Book of Romans as he restarts the God With Us series. If you plan to come in person, remember to save a seat, and we'll see you either on-site or online next weekend.